I work primarily in the uh, as a micropaleontologist in the petroleum area, but uh, GNS has moved away from petroleum, uh, so I've been moved across to the groundwater team. So I felt a bit uncomfortable there because groundwater, microfossils, how is this going to work? But uh, hopefully through this talk, you'll get an idea of uh, how I found a little niche myself in that little coastal plain zone. Now, what I'm going to be talking about is the uh, aquifer system um, running through the Hutt Valley and beneath Wellington Harbour. And it was quite opportune that actually uh, got into this uh, in that they drilled uh, a couple of uh, boreholes in Wellington Harbour. And uh, what I'm showing here is just the aquifer, like this area around here is the unconfined zone, which means the gravels are exposed to the surface. So this is where the water goes into the aquifer. And this zone down here near the coast, lower part of the Hutt Valley, that's where you have the marine mards and silts overlying your gravel so it's confined and that extends out into the harbour. Now this borehole that I was talking about it was drilled off the Miramar Peninsula um, oh, about seven or eight years ago now and the main reason for drilling it is that the current water supply for Wellington most of it comes down the Hutt Road along the Wellington Fault. And you can imagine what would happen in a major earthquake or something, that pipe would be disrupted, uh, cut off the water supply. So the idea of drilling out in a borehole into the harbour was to intersect the Waiwatu aquifer, hopefully find a, a supply of drinkable water and run a, a pipeline up into the Miramar Peninsula where they've got a reservoir and use that to distribute around the Wellington city and southern suburbs. That's in the case of emergency. So that was the primary aim of drilling the borehole. But uh, we're fortunate in that uh, this borehole was continuously cored. So it's 80 metres of sediment. And uh, it was actually deposited out here at GNS. So I was able to get my hands onto it um, and uh, do some work. So the main purpose of examining the core was to actually look what was in it, try and define the sedimentary facies, and try and develop an age model uh, using the international sea level curve. So we'll get into how that process works. Now this is an uh, image of the actual rig itself, which is on a barge with a jack up, and it got towed out onto site, and uh, then it was just anchored in position the uh, jacks went down and when it was on site it looked pretty much like this sitting on site and they drilled down so here's the actual drilling rig itself it's a sonic drilling rig which means it basically uh, uses high uh, just vibrations high frequency vibrations oscillating and it liquefies the sediment and just pushes the core down so it's located off the uh, Miramar Peninsula, um, a couple of kilometres out, and uh, just to the west of the Soames Island Ridge. Now, the stratigraphy in the harbour and the Hutt Valley, uh, there was some work done, a 3D geological model, and this was done for engineering uh, ground motion studies. Uh, uh, for building strength and housing, things, what would happen to earthquake, that sort of thing. So they basically constructed a series of layers. And these were assigned rough ages. Uh, when I say rough ages, uh, this is based on uh, panelological work that was done on holes drilled uh, along the Petoni foreshore. Um, and uh, that, that was dated using panelology. And what palynology does, it takes a sample, and the first thing it does, it crushes the sample, so anything large gets broken up. Then they put it in hydrochloric acid, so anything calcareous disappears. Then they put an HF, anything siliceous disappears, and then they oxidize it, so all the light organic matter disappears. And what they get left is the very resistant spores and pollen, and that's what they analyze. So that's the important distinction of uh, panological analysis. 
near that. So when I undertake a micro paleontological analysis of these samples, I'm looking at everything that a palynologist would destroy in the preparation of their samples. Now, this is the uh, borehole logs from the uh, borehole that was drilled in the harbour. As you can see from the logs, there's the gravel show up really nicely, clearly identified, uh, the depths and things, the thicknesses. So great stratigraphy. They know what they were targeting and everything. They know the depths, but they don't really know the age or anything. So this is what I'm trying to do. I'll move on. Now, when I... Uh, got these samples, I didn't look at the gravels. I looked at the uh, mud intervals. So I didn't look at the gravels. I looked at all the mud intervals between. And I washed them as a standard micropaleontological sample. In other words, I uh, took a piece of mud, put it in a pan, dried it out, soaked it in water, and washed it over a 63 micron sieve to get rid of all the uh, silt and clay and then put the uh, sand residue under the microscope and pick out what was in it. So as you can see here, uh, some nice little uh, micro mollusks and um, gastropods, bivalves, uh, fragments of shells. It's clearly marine, no problems there. And I'm actually showing some ages here, so I'm preempting a little bit. I'll show you how I get these ages, but just to show you that these marine intervals occur at different intervals down the wall. Um, here's some uh, echinoid spines and uh, plate fragments, um, like sea urchins, very common, clearly marine. Uh, this is something you might actually recognize. These are fragments of uh, crabs, uh, crab claws and such, which have, tend to be quite common in parts. Often, you know, if you go along the beach and that sort of thing, you'll see crabs running around. Now, this is uh, a group that's a little bit more unusual. It took me a little while to work out what these were. And these little oscals, little calcareous oscals, like sponge-like little features, they sort of fit together. And what they are, they're actually the um, elements of a brittle star, like a starfish, you know, with these small body with wriggling arms and things. So they, this is what's actually inside these uh, wriggling arms and some more echinoid spines. Uh, here's a group that I'm more familiar with, foraminifera, uh, different species. And just run through, show you that they're quite diverse. Uh, and they give you quite good information. Like these things are typical of uh, soft, muddy bottom. These things are more typical of a sandy, uh, high energy. This is more muddy. You know, so, so they give you quite good environmental information. These are uh, calcareous species. These are agglutinated species. And these are porcelainous species. So all different types. The diversity is actually quite high. Another group of microfossils that you come across, calcareous, these are actually crustacea, ostracots. So uh, similar to crabs, but in this case, the crab-like organism actually lives inside this little bivalve shell. And uh, it just opens a little bit and crawls on the ground. And it's interesting enough, as this organism grows, it sheds the shell and then forms another shell. So you get a whole series of smaller through to larger shells, but marine, no doubt about that. Some more marine uh, microfossils, um, holotherian egg cases. You know, you've seen sea squirts, sea urchins on the seafloor walking around. These are the little egg cases where they come from. And these little siliceous things here, they're actually the spines that you actually find inside the holotherians. You know, um, they're supposed to be a delicacy. Uh, I've tried it once and I did not enjoy it at all. Very tough, leathery like. And it had a gritty sort of taste. And that was because it had these little silicious spines inside them. Yeah, that's certainly an acquired taste. But again, clearly marine. Um, another group of microfossils I came across, uh, you might recognize some of these. Uh, there's these teeth, fish teeth, uh, fish bones. And you can see here a scale. So they're fish remains. Fine. 
clearly marine. So that, that's the evidence for marine that I found in these samples. And this group here is a very important uh, microfossil, a forum. It actually lives in brackish water, in fact, so much so that uh, sometimes it's the only forum that you'll find in brackish environments where you get the mixing between fresh water and saline water in river estuaries and things like that. So when you get a high abundance of this and it dominates, it's clearly a brackish estuary type environment. Now, yes, I mentioned some diatoms. Uh, this is actually what they look like. They're a bit smaller than the uh, forams. Uh, as you can see, this box is about four millimeters by four millimeters. So they're only a fraction of a millimeter. And uh, but there was about two species in the sample, and uh, I'm almost certain that they're uh, freshwater diatoms. Then uh, other parts of the uh, core, I found lots of seeds. Uh, you can see the sort of some of the diversity here. Quite quite diverse. Look, look like little corn cobs. Um, these are actually leaves. Um, from a manuka-like plant and more seeds. And here's little bits of woody material, uh, various grades and things, and you can start to see some organic structure. Uh, these things over here, just a little bit of gypsum. Um, and again, more plant material. So clearly, when you get this sort of material, you're no longer in a marine environment. You're in a terrestrial environment, but because this material is often quite delicate and everything like that, it's a low energy environment. So it's a coastal plain environment. Once you go up a river system, high energy, most of this material gets smashed to pieces and you wouldn't see it. So when you get an abundance of this type of material and it's quite diverse, generally you can define it as a lower coastal plain environment. Again, some more uh, plant microfossils. In this case, uh, seeds and spores, trilete spores, uh, possibly the, um, I think, fern or moss or something like that, um, clearly um, very abundant species. So using all that information from down the borehole, um, this is just a reminder where the borehole is located in the harbour. This is a very simplified log of the borehole. Mud, gravel, mud, okay? So uh, my initial interpretation was that the muddy intervals will be marine and the gravel intervals will be non-marine. That was my initial interpretation. And that is generally what people have based their age models on in terms of fitting it to glacial, interglacial cycles. But when I actually looked at the environment, um, I actually picked through the samples and I generated a uh, species count. So I went through the different size fractions like 500, 300, 212, um, 150, 125, and just a cumulative species counts. So diversity, essentially. So the higher the diversity, basically the more marine it is. The lower the diversity, the less marine, and then you get to non-marine intervals in between. Uh, like here, you just get uh, a couple of species. They're uh, brackish water things. Uh, yeah, so essentially, I was able to say that this upper mud, this mud, and the lower mud were marine, and these two muds in here were non-marine. Um, this mud in here, it was actually where I found the uh, seeds and spores and things, and also found the freshwater diatoms. And this one, I found uh, no diatoms. I only just found the uh, organic matter. So uh, I characterized the facies in terms of marine, uh, the gravels, which are basically the aquifer beds, um, coastal plain, lacoste drying, coastal plain, and uh, fluvial fan. Uh, I'll get to the difference between fluvial fan and uh, the aquifer gravels in that these gravels are, tend to be a bit muddier 
poor quality aquifer, whereas these are good quality aquifers. So I went through this. And the interesting thing is when you actually look at this curve, for example, if we just look at uh, this upper mud here, you can see it goes from non-marine, then it gets estuarine, low diversity, then all of a sudden the diversity shoots up. So it's a very rapid deepening. And when you actually look at Wellington Harbour, there's a hard rock sill out here. So you can imagine sea level um, below the lip of the uh, harbour entrance. All of a sudden it rises up to getting near the harbour entrance. You get storms and things, so you get stuff washing over into the harbour. That's possibly what we're seeing here. Sea level rise a little bit more, and then all of a sudden it just floods in. So you get this very rapid inundation. And then interesting enough, you see a little drop here, a temporary shallowing. It, it could possibly be an earthquake event. I'm not sure. Um, it's just speculation at this stage. But the interesting thing is, as you come through the Holocene, you come up here and get your peak diversity. And that corresponds to the high sea level, which was about six to 7,000 years ago. So sea level was slightly higher uh, six, 7,000 years ago than it is today. So you can get some quite good information just from the 4M data, but it's all this, these muddy intervals in here are really key. The fact that they're non-marine, but the coastal plain of coastline, so they're close to the coast. So that's really important. Now, just digress a little bit. And uh, if we actually, uh, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the oxygen isotope curve, the work of uh, Lezeki and Raymo. And uh, the oxygen isotope curve is basically a proxy for climate. When you have uh, low values, it's warm climate. And when you have higher values, it's cold climate. So you can sort of see, go from an interglacial to a glacial, interglacial, glacial. So you can sort of see the sawtooth pattern going back, in this case, about 800,000 years. It goes back much further than that, but I'm just looking at this part here. And why I'm showing this curve in particular, uh, people are familiar with uh, marine isotope stage one, two, three, four, five, but there's a lot more little wriggles in it. And people have assigned various letters and codes to them and number them differently. So uh, Railsback and his team went through and formally defined these uh, substages within the oxygen isotope curve. So that basically serve as a proxy for dating. Now, just during periods of warm climate, that's when you have uh, minimal ice in your poles. That's when sea level is high. And during your cold periods is when you have your maximum ice build up in your polar regions, and that's when sea level is low. So recently, uh, there's been some very good work done in the Red Sea region. So this red curve is actually the uh, curve that I'm showing you, the oxygen isotope curve. But up here in this blue curve, and again, the shaded bar below is actually the same curve, just uh, overlapping with the isotope curve. That's an estimation of relative sea level, like present day, back to, for example, back to the uh, marine ox oxygen isotope stage two, sea level is about 120 metres lower. So sea level is coming up and down. So you can imagine if you're in that uh, coastal zone near the coast and sea level is going up and down, you're going to get big changes in your sedimentation. Um, you're going to get marine during periods of warm climate and high sea level, the marine's going to transgress onshore. And during periods of low sea level, during periods of cold glacial climate, sea level is going to regress out. So the basic principles of uh, sequence stratigraphy apply. Um, when sea level rises, your sedimentary belts will move inland. And when sea level falls, they'll move seawards. So it's a very basic principle, easy to understand. Now comes the fun part. I use the microfossils to determine the sedimentary facies. So here's the marine, three marine intervals, and here's the coastal plain intervals. Here's the other intervals. So 
we go to this diagram here. Skip this one in the middle. We'll come back to that in a second. So here's the sea level curve, just showing in red here. Now, we know the depth of the borehole. The water is 27 meters deep. So that point is fixed. So then I just drew a straight line down. And I just move the bottom point of that line backwards and forwards through the sea level curve, just, just eyeballing it, until I got a fit like this with the sedimentary fasces. So like here's the marine fasces, here's the coastal plain fasces, here this green is my what I'm calling fluvial fasces, and then uh, this is uh, the ray plane or aquifer facies, the brown. So uh, just by moving back to the forts, and where I actually show the line, that was actually the best fit to explain the marine beds down here, here, and here, and to have these uh, coastal plain facies. As you can see, uh, during stage one and stage 5e, and stage seven, we have marine. But during 5A and 5C, we only get into this coastal plain fasces. So that's why these fasces in particular here actually constrain this curve very, very well. Now, the advantage with that is it's easy to extrapolate. For example, Here's the contact between your gravels and marine beds. Here's that same sort of contact up here. Just move it across. So this is age. This is depth. So the interesting thing about this is that the marine beds are very, very thick, like they're 20 three meters thick. Yet in terms of time, they only represent about 10,000 years of time. If we look at the uh, Waiwatu aquifer, for example, here it's only five meters thick, and yet it represents over 60,000 years. That seems a bit strange, but uh, when you think about it, it's not that strange. Um, I'll just go down. So here, here's my muds, here's my little model, here's my fasces. So this actually shows it. I've taken the same plot. It's, here it's in depth. Here's the same plot, just normalized to age. So you can see the marine beds, very, very condensed. And to, well, they represent relatively little time, but the terrestrial fasces represent a lot of time. And the rationale for that is that gravels can only accumulate when there's a combination space. So when sea level falls, the river, river will flow down through the harbour and erode out and deposit gravels out into the harbour or out into the Cook Strait. But when sea level starts to rise, the gravels start to accumulate. But they can only accumulate at this space. So when sea level is low, the harbor, like the uh, harbor and the hut valley is going down slightly, it creates space. So that is what fills up with the gravel. It can only go back up to the level of the, the uh, subsidence. It can't fill up more than that. But when it, the marine incursion occurs and it breaches that harbour entrance, it goes into the basin, and there's basically a deep basin in there, which is Wellington Harbour, and the mud just settles out. So it accumulates a, a significant thickness of mud. So the thickness of the gravels actually reflect the subsidence rate, whereas the... Uh, marine beds, it's just there's a basin there, it fills up. I'm not sure how clear that is, but uh, it's 
a basic principle in terms of, well, quite unique actually to Wellington Harbour in that it's a hard rock sill at the harbour entrance where you have, uh, for example, in the Wairau River in Blenheim, uh, you don't have a hard rock sill. So when Cedarville falls, the river itself will down cut. And uh, when Cedarville rises, it will fill up that down cut and then back on land. So it's, it's a little bit different situation. So Wellington Harbour is actually quite unique. But one thing about this, the slope on this regression line or best fit line is actually your long-term subsidence rate. Um, there's reference in this sea rise project to uh, New Zealand sea rise project to vertical land movement because sea level is not just the uh, ice sheets melting and sea level rising as a consequence. It's also, you have to factor in vertical land movement. For example, if uh, there was no uh, ice sheets at all, if uh, the land was subsiding, you would have marine incursion, marine flooding. If land was being uplifted, you would have sea, your shoreline would be advancing shoreward or seaward. So uh, changes in relative sea level can be affected by vertical land movement as well as glacio eustatic changes in sea level. So it's important to actually add these two together. So this gives you a pretty good constraint on what's going on the long term rate. So you can see the rate, it's pretty low. It's only 0.126 millimetres per year. Not a lot, but you give it a few thousand years and it is significant. Now, that was the uh, borehole drilled on the harbour. This is another borehole that they drew, drilled on the Petone foreshore. And uh, one of my colleagues said, well, uh, what are you going to find in the borehole? So uh, it was quite a simple matter to do. Here's my uh, little facies model that I generated out in the harbour. Quite simple. That was at 27 metres water depth. So all that I thought I have to do is take the same diagram, but instead of putting this uh, black line here at 27 metres depth or below sea level, which is the uh, seafloor at the site where the borehole was drilled, I just move it to the shoreline, zero. So this is what I've done here. I've just taken this black line, just moved whole everything across to there. So now this my sedimentary facies have shifted shorewards and uh, then generate the facies. So this is my model facies, what I'd actually find in that borehole. You can see it's quite different from what you actually see out here in the harbour. For example, the uh, marine beds out here, by the time you get in here, they're mostly coastal plain. Uh, so there are significant differences. Uh, less marine, uh, more floodplain, or a lower floodplain and break plain. So it's Quite simple. So from a single borehole, I can predict whatever is in the subsurface. Like, for example, if I went up the Hutt Valley to 20 metres elevation, all they do is move this whole, all these facies belt across 20 metres, and I can predict what you would actually find in there. This gives you the age and tells you what's in there, but doesn't actually give you the thickness of the units. You need to uh, test that or do a little bit of modelling in terms of uh, the slope, the gradient in the valley and things like that. You, you can actually estimate it, but uh, it's pretty good. But the main thing uh, in terms of uh, aquifer facies, I'll just go back a couple. The gravels that are deposited, in terms of a aquifer, where you're going to find uh, groundwater for drinking, the best gravels will be the coarsest, best sorted gravels. And they're deposited when sea level is lowest. So you can see down here, here's your baseline. Once you go further away from that baseline, these will be very, very good gravels. Once you get into this green area here, they'll be muddy gravels. 
And then by the time you get into your coastal plain facies, that'll be an aquitard or aquaclude, sort of very, very poor muds and silts. So that basically is seal on your gravels. And then you get marine, and that's predominantly aquaclude and aquitard. So uh, it, it's you know, quite a good way of predicting where you're going to find your good quality gravels. And uh, the, for example, these gravels won't be very good, but these gravels will be. So we've gone through to this borehole. Now to ground truth it, uh, this is what our predictor would be there. This is what I actually found. And uh, compared to the coastal, the uh, borehole drilled in the harbour, all that I found was basically estuarine type facies. You can see the uh, species diversity only got up to about six species, whereas in the harbour borehole, I was getting up over 40 species in some samples. So much less species, much lower diversity, mostly brackish water, shallow marine at best. And uh, so came through. So this is basically what you actually see. And based on this age model, uh, we come down, for example, we've got marine, marine, you can see here, we've got estuary at the base, estuary, so shallow marine. So we're only just really got down to about this level here at the bottom of this hole. This one is much shallower. Well, it's only about a 62 meter uh, borehole. So estimated the fact that we have, actually haven't gone to fully marine conditions, we just, just got into sh very shallow marine, sort of in that coastal plain, shoreline type facies. So that gives the age uh, of about 120,000 years at the bottom of that, whereas the harbour borehole, we were about 200,000 years at the uh, bottom. It was a little bit deeper. Now, I talked about sequence stratigraphy. Uh, this is what I'm talking about in terms of sedimentary facies. When sea level falls, you have an erosional surface and you start to get sediments building out into your deep water facies. So that's during your low stand systems tract. Sea level starts to rise and you get marine incursion coming on shore and you get what we call a transgressive system tract. So this is sediments prograding landward across your shelf and on onto land. When sea level reaches its maximum and high stand, you start to get a little bit of aggradation and you start to get a little bit of uh, progradation back out over the top. So what we call the high stand systems tract. Now, if we go to the uh, McEwen Park uh, borehole, you can actually see the species like here, here's our uh, non-marine sand and gravel. That's your low stand systems tract your sequence boundary coming through. And then we have these slightly more marine estuary type conditions. There will be a transgressive system trait. Then maximum sea level and rise. And then we start to get progradation back out of the top, the high stand system trait. So you start to get the gravels and sand prograding back out of the top. So you can actually see this pattern actually in the sediments. Uh, so it's this sort of analysis of uh, sequence stratigraphy is developed for petroleum industry, mainly for tracking reservoir quality and uh, everything like that. But it applies equally to situations like groundwater systems. So where I'm working with the groundwater team, my colleagues are focusing on the water, the flow of the water, the quality of the water. I'm interested in the sediments, the plumbing system that transports the water. So it's a good synergy. So, so that's basically how I fit into this groundwater team. And this is an example. This was just a, uh, a simplistic cartoon conceptual model. But you can see here that this yellow stuff, this is the Holocene beds. So uh, you can see the marine sand and gravel. So this is your beach shoreline facies sort of coming on to your maximum 
uh, sea level about six, 7,000 years ago, and then your transgressive system track coming out over the top. So you get this wedge-like feature here. Similar sort of thing back through uh, stages two, three, and four, and similarly down here, but it's not that accurate. But it gives you an idea. You can sort of see how changes in sea level, vertical land movement, are impacting on the distribution of your sedimentary facies. Go through that. All right, so this is the diagram that I showed early on, um, which I showed the uh, label, the different units. But this is actually the ages of these units. Um, you compare to the original geological model, uh, for example, this unit down here was uh, estimated to be 128 to 245, refine the age a bit more and everything. So yeah, tie down the ages quite nicely with some of these units. Now, what I'm gonna do is take you on a very quick um, history of uh, Wellington Harbour and uh, the changes through time. So just to orientate yourself, here's a, down the bottom right, there's some photos of the actual uh, core itself. Uh, it's not that great in that uh, they stuck a probe down the middle of it uh, to do uh, strength testing and things like that. But uh, you can get an idea of what the sediment looks like. And this curve I've actually highlighted in red when the this sort of sediment was deposited. So here's our Holocene beds. So I'm going to go through a series of analogs. So this is basically present day harbour. This is uh, for the Holocene. Yeah, it would have been a little bit smaller than this, but it gives you an idea of basically what uh, it would look like. Go back now. We're back into stage, marine isotope stages two, three, and four. And uh, you can see the sorts of sediments here, uh, gravels, a little bit of mud and parts, quite well rounded, quite well sorted. And this is uh, early image, uh, black and white image taken up near Mary Bank, quite a river. But this is basically uh, at that site in the harbour, that borehole E3, E3A. This is basically what it would look like when those sediments were deposited 11 to 80,000 years ago. Um, you come now to 80, 85,000 years ago, uh, you can sort of see where sea level is now. We're just into the sort of coastal plains sort of zone here. And this is an artist's impression of the Hutt River estuary. A lot of uh, swampy ground, vegetation round and everything like that. Um, yeah, it's quite good. We also, in that same interval, we get uh, freshwater diatoms. So uh, this is an image of Lake Wairapa, uh, possible analog for what the harbour might have looked like uh, 80, 85,000 years ago. In fact, here's a, a, a conceptual model that John Begg uh, put together. This shows the borehole here. Uh, so the Hutt River would have been flowing out through here towards the present day harbour entrance. Here's your Soames Island Ridge. And in the back here, in towards the harbour, uh, you can sort of see this freshwater lake, the swampy lake. So that's where the diatoms would have been deposited. So it gives you an idea how the changes have taken place. Come a little bit further, sea levels fall a little bit more, but we're in. We're not into the bright plain. We're into the uh, lower flood plain, and you can see these muddy gravels, a lot more finer silt and sand, and so. Not good aquifer, but uh, yeah, fluvial clearly. Um, come back in here and we get back into the coastal plain zone. Uh, this is Punakaiki, and you can see these swamps, nice vegetation and things like that. Uh, and back a little bit further, and we get back into that same sort of uh, muddy gravel facies again. So we're about 106 to 114,000 years ago. Uh, we go back a bit more. This is back to stage 5e. So 114 to 131,000 years ago, we're back into the harbour, uh, marine inundation, uh, marine beds there. Interesting enough, you don't see a lot of shoals or anything in here. They are, but there is clearly very good microfossil evidence that this is marine. 
Uh, and then we get back here again a little bit further, 130 to 190,000 years ago, and we get these uh, finer muddy gravels and things. So more, again, like uh, the uh, Hutt River near Maori Bank. And then at the bottom of the hole, uh, back about 195, 200,000 years ago, we're back to marine again. So that just these are just snapshots of basically what Welling Harbour might have looked like, you know, if we just sort of through time. This is like what the facies would look like at that borehole in the harbour uh, through time. And that's just using the sedimentary facies from the microfossils. Now, almost at the end, um, I don't want to go on too long, but I'm just giving you an overview. Now, you might have heard uh, there's been a recent study, it's received a lot of publicity, the New Zealand Sea Rise Project. And uh, they've taken uh, geodetic data and uh, stations on land and everything, and they've estimated the uh, vertical land movement um, for about every uh, five kilometres or so along the coast. So. You can sort of see here, like you're getting subsidence rates here, uh, like around the harbour, like 3.9, you know, 2.3. These are millimetres per year of subsidence. That's very rapid. Now, this these measurements are inter-seismic. In other words, uh, it predated the uh, Kokora earthquake because... Uh, Sure, you know, once you get a major earthquake, it does affect the land movement and everything. So this is what's going on between earthquakes. But they're using these values to estimate uh, the impacts of sea level rise. For example, they know globally the average sea level rise just from melting ice sheets is about three and a half millimetres per year. So then, in other words, if land wasn't moving up or down, Sea level would be rising at 3.5 millimetres per year. Now, in the circle, I averaged all the values from the New Zealand Sea Rise Project and it came a value of about uh, 3.2 millimetres per year. You add that to the 3.5 and you get a relative sea level rise of 6.7 millimetres per year. Now, that is quite alarming because uh, it means... Uh, Long Petone and Long Eastbourne and parts of the harbour, everything, they're going to go under very, very rapidly. But there is a bit of hope in that uh, here's my borehole in the middle of the harbour here. The long-term average substance rate is only 0.126. So it's not 3.2, it's much less than that. So, but that is an average over the long term. And that takes into effect, this long-term average takes into effect uh, the near and far field earthquakes, the general tectonic deformation, um, sediment supply. Uh, if you, for example, uh, compaction of uh, poorly compacted muds, for example, like those Holocene muds in the harbour, they'll be compacting, so that'll create substance. If you take groundwater out of the aquifer system, that's going to cause subsidence. If you recharge the aquifer system, that's going to cause uplift. So all this vertical land movement is a sum of all sorts of things. But uh, the main thing I just want to highlight, that in Wellington at least, there's a big discrepancy between the long-term average subsidence and the short-term inter-seismic uh, average. So... Uh, that has to be taken into account. It's useful information. And probably the uh, most important thing is that uh, when there is a large discrepancy between your uh, short-term vertical land movements from geodetic data, your inter-seismic rates, and your long-term data, uh, you can use the long-term data to, uh, for example, do probabilistic models of seismic events. Um, if you know that, okay, the inter-seismic is going down this fast, but there must be seismic events to bring it back up, you can work out the frequency of seismic events and likely recurrence of near and far-field earthquakes and things like that. So uh, 
it's only a new area uh, I have to discuss with people yet, but it just shows some of the applications. So the work I've done with these microfossils has been to date the uh, borehole, but then it has a lot of applications, not just for groundwater, but also for sea level rise, uh, for um, in geotechnical engineering, uh, land motion studies and things. So it has lots of applications. So it just shows you how diverse the microfossils are, how useful they can be when you um, put them into the context of other data. Now, one of the things that I just, uh, I don't know if any of you have any uh, ability to help, but every year there's hundreds of uh, boreholes drilled in the coastal plains and things, but samples are rarely collected. A driller may find a shell and he may collect that, put it in a bag or something like that, that or a bit of wood, and that's about it. But uh, these boreholes, especially the deep boreholes near the coast, need to be sampled closely. Uh, especially for fine grain layers. So we can actually look at the microfossil content and actually use this to actually estimate or estimate the age models, generate the vertical land movement and apply it in terms of sea level rise and uh, engineering and ground motion studies and things. So it's, yeah, it's an exciting new area to work in, and but I'm still finding my way. So I'll stop sharing now and uh, address any questions.